Good afternoon, those that can make it. Um, welcome to this fourth session on the real time pricing project, uh, the, outlining the changes that will be coming in the next 12 months or so. Uh, in this session, we'll be talking about the scarcity pricing principles. Uh, this is a almost a part one of two. We'll have a second session in four to six weeks run by Transpower to talk about the implementation of scarcity pricing and how it will impact schedules and what you'll see in the market. So as a rem reminder for anybody who does join, we'll be keeping an eye on the Q&A. There'll be points through the presentation that will stop and answer questions. Uh, this will be recorded and will be put on the both Cognize platform and the authorities YouTube channel. So you'll be able to review it and there'll be any uh, transcript of any Q&A on Cognize as well following this session. So today we'll talk briefly about the drivers for change and then, then the need for improved market information as we're related to scarcity pricing. A very quick talk about how energy and reserve co-optimization complicates the issue before we plunge into the principles behind energy scarcity, then reserve scarcity, and then a very quick next steps for the next session and following work. So, as we've said through this uh, project, the idea behind real-time pricing is that spot prices must be actionable. We can't have ex post processes uh, changing the results after the fact. We want people to be able to react to the prices they see and have confidence that they are reacting to a true price. Parallel with this, energy scarcity at the moment is, as we said in the pre-reading material, is an island-wide or national um, indication. And again, through a post-process to actually provide true indications for investment and where it's actually needed, we want its scarcity to be at a nodal level. The existing ex post processes don't port well to a real time environment. There's aside from the process of infeasibility resolution, which has to happen before we can actually apply the scarcity situations now. Um, as I said, energy scarcity process doesn't provide geographic resolution. It's very much a blunt instrument as far as talking about uh, where resources are best targeted. The virtual reserve provider process can actually suppress reserve prices during scarcity, which runs counter to what we want out of a scarcity price. And we'll discuss that. That's we'll discuss that a little bit later in the presentation. And also the current treatment of multiple risk setting plants, so where you have two or more uh, plant scheduled to points where they are equally setting the reserve risk in an island, um, that can actually have a price suppression effect on energy. So as I said, improved market information is the big driver. We it's not just enough to have real time scarcity to, for people to be able to react uh, confidently. There needs to be that forward view as well. So um, the current infeasibility signals in the schedules can be quite unclear as to what's causing those, uh, which leads to confusion as to whether a response is needed or where it's needed. Um, and also the, the, the current infeasibility prices are not a true indication of pricing impact. They'll be washed out in the uh, infeasibility resolution process. And then if there is uh, a scarcity, then the scarcity pricing will apply. So until you get to that point, which could be two days after the actual trading day, you won't know what actually the pricing is going to be. We want to encourage efficient responses and to do that you need to know where the resource and what size of resource is needed to avoid scarcity if possible. So we want to be, we want to send the signal that only a certain amount of response is needed, whether that's demand management or reserve um, offering. So therefore any changes that we apply in the dispatch schedule to reflect real time scarcity have to be reflected in the forward schedules to a degree and a lot of that um, information as to how that's going to work will be discussed in the next session. 
So energy and reserve co-optimization co is one of the wrinkles that makes this more complex. Um, we, we're relatively unique having a dynamically co-optimized energy and reserve market. And this means we've got to think a bit smarter about how we handle scarcity and how, how we deal with it in real time. So however we set the scarcity values, they have to work for multiple risk setters. They have to work for having simultaneous fast and sustained instantaneous reserve deficits because they can be additive effects on the price. And it's also got to maintain the reserve scarcity versus energy scarcity priorities we currently have. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So those of you who've been keeping an eye on the project for the last few years will recognize this uh, diagram from 2017 where we um, at a high level talk about the priorities that we have that we're trying to maintain. So you can see at the bottom, the normal generation offers sit below in the price stack before we hit into reserve shortages, then into the default energy scarcity pricing blocks that we have. And this is for load that's forecast currently by the system operators load forecast tool, any demand bids, any dispatchable demand bids uh, that are bid in will remain as um, pricing blocks in their own right. Then there's the potential for higher price generation offers and higher price dispatchable demand bids to further set the price to indicate um, willingness to pay for resources. Now, this is the tricky one, actually maintaining the reserve shortage CVPs in, and maintaining that priority of reserve shortage ahead of energy uh, scarcity. Um, as I say, conceptually, we've kept that there. And as we discussed in the 2019 consultation, which was in the pre-reading material, we've managed to keep that and we've found a way, we think, of maintaining those priorities with reasonable prices. And there's still some detail to work through. So those of you, again, you'll remember this diagram of energy scarcity where we have the energy stack and the blue line represents the demand forecast and bids that currently set the price with the scarcity tranches illustrated in the red line above. So under normal operation, nothing really changes. The intersection of demand sets the price, but we have these 5, 10 and 15% 5, 15 and 80 percent, sorry, blocks at five, uh, 10, 15 and 20 thousand dollars. The remaining. Uh, so we've got a brief explanation there of where those values came from, and they're based on the current cap and floor settings in the market. So how does this work when supply doesn't meet demand? As you can see here, the supply curve doesn't quite meet the demand line. So we draw the line, redraw the line to meet the supply stack. We have an energy shortfall, which sets the price. At this case, in the first energy shortage tranche at $10,000. And we say an energy shortfall, this could be an indication of directed demand management, but system operator has a number of means of managing this shortfall in operationally, and that'll be discussed in a later session. So reserve scarcity. Currently, we the market system prioritizes some reserve scarcity ahead of any demand shedding, and that's we want to preserve supply where possible, and having the, the risk of loss of supply is less onerous on participants, on uh, consumers. This does mean we have to set the reserve scarcity values to ensure that our grid security objectives are met. So some contingent event scarcity is acceptable ahead of demand shedding. Um, however, extended contingency event scarcity should be avoided if possible. Uh, and this is the difference between a, a single generation or single supply unit dropping off at a contingent event and losing a significant supply such as the HVDC bipole, making sure we have the reserve to cover that is uh, the, the bipole is essential because of the potential risk of blackout, whereas a contingent event scarcity, we still have awfuls as a backup should something happen. So there, there is a security, security risk is managed. 
This is complicated by having multiple risk setting plants, potential multiple risk setting plants and simultaneous fear and scarcity. So this is the point where I was going to take some questions. So uh, preliminary assessment is that your proposed approach would address the issues underlying the disputes in ERCOP, but might be a good cross check for yourself. Yes, um, we have been keeping an eye on what happened in ERCOT and one uh, big difference from our proposal to the way that ERCOT implements scarcity is that once ERCOT had operationally initiated rolling outages, so that planned response, they continued applying scarcity pricing with the New Zealand system. We're maintaining the current check on that where if there's a planned uh, response such as rolling outages, then scarcity pricing will no longer apply. We'll move back to uh, meeting the the demand with the available supply and prices settling probably at an elevated, but not necessarily at scarcity prices. OK, I'll just give that a minute to make sure that we have nothing else to pick up at this point. OK, so we'll move on to the next section. Reserve scarcity for multiple risk setters. So when more than one plant is dispatched to an output that requires the same level of cover, they're, they're both considered uh, simultaneous risks on the system. Uh, with the current scarcity settings, the reserve would be undervalued when we have more than one risk setting plan. So only a fraction of the reserve price adds to the energy price for the risk setting plan. So whatever the marginal reserve price would be, only half of it applies to the energy price for, for two risk setters, for three risk setters, only a third. Um, if there is a scarcity of reserve, then the final reserve price, once any infeasibilities have been resolved, would be calculated as either the maximum of the highest offered reserve price or three times the highest cleared unconstrained energy offer. And this isn't necessarily a price that we, we consider reflects scarcity. Under real-time pricing, we've reversed the value proposition. So we're saying how much generation will be made available by one megawatt of reserve rather than how much um, reserve is required to find the next megawatt of energy. So in this case, the full reserve price will be added to the marginal energy price for the risk setting plant. This ensures that highly priced energy offers are more likely to be dispatched ahead of reserve scarcity. Um, and it also reflects the value back to the reserve providers of the reserve. Um, so just to illustrate that, this is currently what happens. So conceptually, say we have a two risk setting plant situation. We've set the reserve scarcity price at four and a half thousand dollars as we're proposing in real time pricing. And we let SPD run under it, under its current settings. We have a marginal plant at $300 and the next highest energy offer in the stack is $3,000 per megawatt hour. So say we're in reserve violation for that. The reserve violation would add half of the reserve scarcity price to the energy price. And this would put the price at around $2,500. SPD would then schedule reserve scarcity ahead of dispatching the energy for on the remaining plant. If we move to RTP and the way we're proposing it, we use the same assumptions. We have a marginal reserve violation would add the full reserve scarcity price to the energy price. So the marginal energy price of that risk setting plant would be $4,800. This places it well above the next energy offer, so SPD would make the decision all things being equal, to dispatch that energy instead of going into reserve deficit. So that way we maintain the principles we want of dispatching energy ahead of reserves violation. Uh, whilst there are energy, is energy in the stack, it's more likely that that will be dispatched ahead of reserve violations. Are there any questions there? I'll just give a couple of minutes for the presentation lag to catch up to make sure we have nothing else.
OK, so we'll move on to the next part of it. Fur and sur deficit. So. Fast reserve has a critical role in arresting the frequency drop during an event. Sustained instantaneous reserves role is to restore the frequency back to the normal band after the drop has been arrested. The impact of a third deficit is the increased likelihood of the use of orthals to cover a contingent event tripping. If the market has the option, we'd, pref we'd prefer a third deficit over a third deficit. So we can bias SPD towards making this decision by varying the relative prices of the um, deficits for fur and sir. In the 2019 consultation, we proposed this table of values ranging from $4,500 up to $18,000 for fur and $4,000 up to $17,500 for sir. So as we stated at the time, we'll review these and confirm them as we go through before we as we go through our development, both the prices and the quantities. Um, in all likelihood, we're not likely to remain an unlimited C um, deficit reserve quantity. There's definitely a point where we'd prefer to manage demand than risk having very little or no reserve dispatched. Just for those who are graphically minded, here's a representation of how the energy um, deficit values in red kind of match up against the reserve deficit values. And you can see we've reflected the the operational requirement of reserve requirement, a reserve deficit ahead of energy deficit by placing those first three reserve tranches below the first energy uh, deficit tranche. As I've said several times, we need to ensure that reserve scarcity values promote efficient and secure market outcomes. As we progress through development, we'll be modeling and refining these prices and volumes to ensure that we get the desired dispatch outcomes. We expect to stay with the lower price bias for the reserve tranches to maintain that discrimination with energy scarcity tranches. Um, we may well work through the, we may well revise the tranche volumes, so the megawatts associated with each of those scarcity prices to make sure we're reflecting our risk underlying risk management uh, policies. Okay, give that another 30 seconds for questions. OK, so we haven't finalized everything yet. We've uh, been working through the contingent values as they're, as they're most pressing for ensuring that the dispatch solution works. We also have to work on an ECE scarcity value. Currently, um, the ECE reserve scarcity uh, CVP constraint violation price in SPD is set well above the level for uh, generation deficit, so lack of generation to supply. We can we acknowledge that going go allow go we allow the system to go into a C deficit, acknowledging that authors are available to prevent cascade failure should there be a significant um, CE event. Uh, a shortage of reserve for an ECE risk has no such backup. If there's not enough awfuls to and reserve to cover a HVDC then a HVDC tripping, then there's nothing to catch the system should an event happen. Um, so we're working through how we set values to reflect that that are um, valid for setting prices whilst maintaining the security uh, requirements of the system. So in the next session, system operator will discuss the practical implementation of these values and how you will see them reflected in the market schedules. And we aim to review and confirm the scarcity values for the final code consultation, which we're aiming currently aiming for early 2022. So thank you for your time. Uh, if you have any further questions and feedback, please do email us. Um, and apologies to those who are viewing this in recording. We'll work through our technical difficulties with teams ready for the next session. Thank you very much.
are there any further questions? I'll just give it a couple of minutes before we sign off. <laughs> 